Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Real Estate 360 Live. For those of you not familiar with our show, we do this national podcast. Um, we, we talk about everything under the sun in regards to real estate. Uh, many people, you know, listen to ra- radio shows about real estate where, you know, bas- basically um, glamorizing real estate that it's always a great time to buy. Uh, that's not what we're doing here. We try to break things down. We're going to talk about real estate, the economics behind it, um, implications, of what the Fed's been doing, manipulating interest rates and printing money out of thin air for some time now. We're going to give you the, the, the information that you need in order to make educated decisions about buying and selling real estate or investing in real estate. Uh, we're going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. So sometimes you, you'll hear us talk a little bit negative. It's not because I'm just a negative person. I'm just being realistic about what's actually taking place. Um, and I want to make sure that you're looking at things from a different light than you're used to. Uh, you can always check us out on the iTunes store if you just type in and search Real Estate 360. Uh, you can listen to us on iTunes. You can download it to your phones, your iPod, whatever you want to do there. You can also go to the website at realestate360live.com. That's realestate360live.com. You can also stream it live right from there, um, however you choose to do it. I do encourage people to listen in weekly because, you know, we're always dissecting and breaking down what's going on most current and recent events. And for those of you out there shopping for um, a house and looking at interest rates and trying to determine when the best time to lock in, a lot of what we break down will help you make these educated decisions. Um, So, you know, it's definitely worth tuning in to. Joining me on our panel, as he does every week, is Louis Camarasano. Louis is a former school teacher, a former attorney, and a former general manager of a major real estate portal. He's often cited in the media as a real estate industry expert. He's been um, cited in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Smart Money, Fox Business, MSN, and numerous others. Lewis, how are you doing today? Doing grand, Ryan. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. So, you know, we've, we've had a lot going on. Um, what I plan to want to jump into today, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. We have non-farm payrolls coming out today. Um, we've had interest rates moving up almost a half a percent in the last two weeks. Uh, we've got the Qualified Residential Mortgage Rule, which is set to take place January 10th of next year. And then I'm going to dive into one of the questions that I get asked all the time, the million-dollar question out there that I feel should never be asked unless somebody's buying an investment property. And we'll dive into that later in the show. Um, But let's start out with, you know, what's transpired this week in the market. Um, Obviously, I believe it was yesterday, European Central Bank came out. They left their key interest rate unchanged at 0.25%. And the ECB, President Draghi, had um, basically said that they don't, plan on making any more cuts to their key interest rates. Um, we also had the employment data, the initial weekly jobless came, came in below 300,000, uh, which is much lower than the market expectations of 323,000. Um, so, and the continuing jobless claims were also lower than expected. So, obviously, this is what the market considered good economic news. Once again, making mortgage interest rates worse. So, what we've seen in the last two weeks, Lewis, we've, we've lost a half a percent in mortgage interest rates literally in a two-week period. And I yep. think this highlights, highlights what we always talk about, about how quick at the drop of a dime that interest rates can swing up, right? And everybody's kind of caught. They're caught up like, well, how did that happen? I, I was getting ready to buy next month, and, and now all of a sudden they're a half higher, and I can't afford my $500,000 house. Now I can only afford $460,000. Um, and – there's, there, everybody's saying now, and I'm getting the questions every single day, okay, well, they went up a half percent. So, hey, do you think that they're going to go back down and, to where they just were? Well, I don't hold that crystal ball. And I, we discussed on the show last week, Lewis, about, you know, seasonality of interest rates and typically around the holidays, interest rates do typically rise. Um, but I think we have a lot of different things going on right now, which uh, may, or may, may or may not hold true from, from prior years. Um, but what is your take on these reports? I mean, you know how I feel about the reports. I feel like they're a joke. I feel like they manipulate these reports. I feel like, um, okay, employment's getting better. We have less jobless claims. The GDP was revised upwards. So right now we're somewhere over, what, 3.6% or something like that versus um, what they quoted at 2.8%. And um, 
existing home sales have been down for basically the last six months. The Fed supposedly now is looking at all of this, these reports and saying that, whoa, it looks like a taper is going to come soon. Well, I, I've got a question for them. So everything's doing so grand, and employment is, is turning around. So yesterday, uh, there was what, I believe in over 100, 100 different cities across the country, we had fast food workers that were striking to basically increase their wages, right? So people are complaining that they're not getting paid enough. And then on that same, same day, Applebee's, releases that they're going to unveil their waiter terminator, which that was an article, I believe, on like Zero Hedge, um, which basically is a, a computerized screen that would eliminate the use for, for waiters so they could actually order their food there. These are all moves to basically eliminate humans out of, of the job process, correct? So all these things coupled together, I can't imagine how things are actually getting better. But to move forward into the holiday season where we've got Christmas and wanting to keep consumer sentiment high so people will spend money, that's the only thing logical that makes sense to me as to what's going on right now is that they want to keep people on emotional highs so that they spend, you know, they spend with their, their, their hearts and not with their heads, and that's probably what's transpiring. What is your take on all this? Well, as to the uh, holiday shopping, there were reports that it's been the worst since 2009. So if that's the strategy, that isn't working because we know that <clears throat> the United States economy, for better or for worse, lives off of consumer spending at 70% of GDP. And when they release the GDP number, that portion of the GDP uh, is not really robust. What drove the GDP higher was business inventories, which means they stocked up on stuff um, you know, maybe because they fear inflation or maybe they, miss out, uh, they misinterpreted where the demand might be. But the point is when you build up inventories and there isn't demand to match it, <clears throat> in the next quarter you have a reduction in GDP. So <clears throat> excuse me, the, what, what you explained about these reports um, is typical uh, for politics. Politics always aims for the middle. Um, so all, in all the reports, there's something in there for everybody. They never have reports where they, even if the report is really bad, there's always a positive spin they can put on it. The report is never that good where people get too excited and think, well, okay, things are doing great. We don't need QE. So the Fed feeds off of this uh, ability to interpret the data one way or the other. Okay, initial jobless claims were lower than expected. Uh, so that could say, well, look, the market's turning around. People aren't getting laid off anymore. But then they immediately come out and say, well, there's seasonal adjustments. Uh, and then when the job market uh, report comes out, if it looks too good, people start saying it's part-time jobs that were created. So there's never a real definitive sense of where the market is headed, even though objectively the market has not improved one bit. Right. Because that's, that's the reality. And they can't say that because if the Fed were to base its policy on – the market's not improving, so they have to show some signs of recovery. Then it begs the question of why are you printing up $4 trillion over the past five years and handing it to the banks if nothing good is happening? So now they're back into this, and they, we saw it all year, whether they should taper or not. But the real giveaway is these guys are saying, look, we're seeing positive data. We're not, and therefore we might taper. They won't. <laughs> but what, what they say, Ryan, about don't worry about the taper even if we do it because we're going to keep interest rates low. We're going to be accommodative for many years to come. Well, that's an admission right. that the economy is not doing well. You don't need to tell the market for years on end that you're going to have an accommodative mar uh, monetary policy if you believe the economy is getting better. So that's right. the real issue that we have, Ryan, is that the economy is not getting better all these reports that come out really are bad. Even when they look good, they're bad. But right. even the Fed will say they're not that good when they look good because they don't want to create the impression that everything is fine either because they always want to be able to say we have to do QE and we have to be accommodative. And they've slipped from time to time. Bernanke has said the economy is weak and would crash if interest rates went higher. And they know the only way to keep interest rates low is QE. And we talk about this week in and week out. And this guy Lockhart from the Atlanta Fed president comes out and says, taper's on the table in, 
in December. And maybe it is, but it's been on the table, or they said it's been on the table. It's been on the table, off the table for months right. and months and months and for years and years and years. They've just Absolutely. been doing QE. Now, Ryan, my question for you is, you've always said they're not going to do it, they're never going to do it. December, are they going to taper? No. No. Okay. Not even not 100% no. Not even not, for the purposes of Bernanke's legacy to say, I started the taper and then Yellen screwed it up and then she untapered in, in the following uh, in, no. in, in the following year. No, and, and 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 here's my position why they haven't even tapered and we had a, a half a percent increase in mortgage interest rates. Correct. Right. Tightening they financial that. conditions. They, that, that was exactly. the reason they didn't do QE in September was tightening financial conditions meant because they didn't do tapered. They talked tapered and it went up to the ten year went up to three percent. And, and, and the points that you brought up just a second ago about them basically always wanting to remain in the center, right, and not going too far to the good, not too far to the bad, but remaining in the center, which always allows them to kind of shift and do what they want. Correct. Um, them, them making a shift now when we have rising interest rates over a half percent in two weeks, and then all of a sudden they would consider tapering, it would send interest rates another half a percent higher immediately, right? Correct. Which, which is they, they, they know better than that. I think So much for learn, accommodative policy then, right? Exactly. So <laughs> they, 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 I think that they've obviously learned from when Bernanke had the, the, the misstep way back when and, and, and rates shot up from when they were in the threes and then they went into the fours, remember? So right. now they've, they've been rising without the Fed doing anything right now. For them to come in and actually say, hey, yeah, we're going to taper, I, I think would be disastrous. I mean, oh, it would be. The, and, and the implica- see, the implications of, of these rising interest rates – Remember, there's always that lag effect, right? So when we just had a half a percent increase, we're not going to really know the statistics from that for probably six months. Right. So, well, you do see, Ryan, though, the mortgage applications. And again, they dropped 13% last week. And of course, instead of saying it was because of rising interest rates, they blamed the weather. It was cold. <laughs> well, mortgage applications have been down for the last, I don't know, 8, 10, 12 weeks. It hasn't been cold for the last three months. Well, you know, and... and I care less about a lot of that. And, you know, I, I sent you an article earlier this week that was from the KCM blog, which the headline was, Are Home Sales Tanking? Um, and, and it basically went into it, hey, if you read the headlines over the last few weeks, some may believe that the houses in the U.S. Are, house sales in the U.S. are beginning to slow dramatically. Um, but there had been, um, obviously, they went in to negate that with, hey, yeah, that, that is true that some of them have gone down, but there's two crucial points that hadn't been addressed. Number one, that home sales are up 6% over the same time last year. Last year. Number two, part of the downturn in recent sales can be traced to falling inventory of distressed property sales. So I find that comical because, okay, so if we have less distressed home sales on the market, which are typically sold below market value, correct, right. Lewis? Mm-hmm. So there's people that are willing to buy deals, right? And who's buying deals? Investors. I mean, it's not necessarily just your average Joe that would be buying its primary residence. So if those have now gone away, and it's more of your standard sale that's on the market, and we don't have increasing or stable existing home sales, that means it's not healthy. It's not moving in the right direction. And did you see the new home sales, Ryan, increase now last month? And the reason for that was prices dropped. Absolutely. The the home builders aren't stupid. They realize in order to compete – they got to lower their prices. Lower prices means people will buy. Higher prices means they won't buy. So that's that catch-22, whereas as prices go up, volume goes down as it should. And if volume goes down, prices come down, and then you get more volume. People start to buy again. So here's the next question, Lewis. So we've got rising interest rates over the last two weeks of about a half a percent across the board. What's the tenure at, 2.84? Um, let's see here. I believe it's somewhere right around there. Which is a big jump from like three weeks ago. 2.87. 87, okay. Yeah, 2.87. So that's rising. And and, and for those of you out there, the 10-year treasury um, is a a key thing to kind of pay attention to because that's almost most of the time it's directly tied into where you see mortgage interest rates. Um, And Ryan, wasn't that – that was where they did not – where it was in September – when they decided that there were, quote, tightening uh, financial conditions that had already started to slow the housing market, and that's why they decided not to taper because the interest rate in the tenure had gone up to about 2.9. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I said at these levels that we're at right now, 
Um, right, you do a taper, it it, bl- it blows through the three percent very quickly. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean it's it, it, I, I mean, it's amazing to me. I mean, how people are just like, I, I don't understand. The, the rates are just going up. They're going up. They have to come back down. And I keep telling people, they don't have to do anything. Um, the Fed can, can, can manipulate. Sure, they can do more of what they've already been doing and, and temporarily push them down. But long term, they will not stay there. And this has been proven to be the case. Well, they're historically um, low, Ryan, and they're, and they're artificially low. Artificially and historically. Now, Great for people that want to buy, that want to lock themselves into long-term fixed rates. I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, I tell people this all the time. If this is still one of the greatest times to buy as far as being able to lock yourself into a low fixed rate. Don't get me wrong. Um, and, you know, as to what I spoke about earlier, the million-dollar question that I get asked all the time is, is, Brian, well, if the interest rates are somewhat low, do you think that if I buy this house today that, you know, if, in this subdivision, that it's going to, in five years from now, that the property values are going to go up. And I think it's the worst question to ever ask. I don't even like answering it. I never really do. Because ultimately, unless you're buying that property as an investment property, is the only time you should really be asking me if I think that there's a potential for there to be an increase in a, in a potential area. Because you're basically speculating when you're buying an investment property, if you're right. buying it for a buy and flip purpose, right, or a buy and hold. Um, but for buying your primary residence, when, when you ask if there's going to be an increase in the value, nobody knows that because there's so many factors that are that are played into it. And at this Correct. point in time, if I were to actually answer it, I would say that home in five years from now, home values could be they could have been dropped fifty percent again, based upon what the Fed's doing now and the long term implications of what they're doing. If you keep interest rates low for an extended period of time for too long, we've already showed what Greenspan did. What happened? It collapsed. Correct. So, not not to mention, we're going to keep interest rates artificially low for an extended period of time, and our employment situation, Lewis, is much much worse. Much, of much course worse. it is. Of course it is, and it'll get worse as Obamacare kicks in uh, next year. There's nothing on the horizon. Uh, you mentioned robotics and so on. That may be good long term, but in the short term, there's pain where those workers are out of work. And if you think about putting restaurant workers out of work and using robots, that's where all the jobs are being created in Absolutely. part-time restaurant work in the service industry. You eliminate those jobs, you don't even have hope for those people to get jobs. So now you have more people on unemployment, disability, food stamps, and so on. If you're trying to eliminate basically minimum wage jobs, which are already low paying to begin with, right? Right. It's, I mean, that's really, I mean, that's, that's, that's the bottom of the barrel here. So we're, we're really up the creek if we're going to get rid of those type of service jobs. Um, of course but, it is, and then and then you know will people patronize these restaurants? I guess they will. They go to Walmart, even though everybody doesn't like Walmart. They still go there and bang the doors down on Thanksgiving. So figure, that's no, the no thing. People, interaction. the solidarity of amongst people who say, uh, you know, it's not fair to the workers. They should get paid more. They'll still go eat there. They'll say it's not fair that you know all this garbage is bought in China with debt off the tax favors. But they still go into Walmart and buy stuff there. So. That argument never works. The same the one that you made a couple of weeks ago. People complain about Bank of America and J.P. Morgan. They still have their money there. They don't go to the credit union. So you can't really count on public sentiment to change economics. People act in their own self-interest. And the way things are headed right now, companies are acting in their own self-interest. They realize their revenues aren't that high, so they have to save on expenses. So they try to cut workers. And they also realize the one bright spot they have is their stock price, so they'll do anything to get their earnings per share up, including buying back their own shares with free cash that they have and cutting expenses by cutting out employees. That yes, is actually a downward spiral because the Fed is creating that behavior. You know, Businesses really should be reinvesting in their business, which would also include hiring if the economy was doing well and they had an opportunity, people had an opportunity to save, invest. It's not the case. It's spend, spend, spend spend on borrowed money, and of course, there's a limit to how much you can spend borrowed money, and we're seeing in that this holiday season. So if that's where your yeah. economy is, it's not going very well. No, and I mean, the fact that Applebee's, and they said this could even move into IHOP, they're, they're being innovative, but really they're just canceling out, like you said, uh, jobs that would go to people, humans. Um, it, that tells you a lot about, you know, they're not profitable with minimum wage employees. 
really, right? right? When, they're, when they're trying to cut those out, that tells you that there's people They're changing are, their whole dining experience. Absolutely. Not so because the diners you. are saying, you know what, we've had enough of these rude waiters. We don't like these waiters. No, people go to Applebee's because they want a service. Yep. And, how and generally, a good waiter is part of your dining experience. I don't know if they have to sit down with you and, and be intrusive, but a good waiter provides you a service, and you're happy that they're there to take care of you. You're not just Absolutely. there to order food like you're at McDonald's. Yeah, and I actually find it quite bizarre that I would walk into a restaurant and just be punching things on a, on a computer screen, and then all of a sudden, at some point in time, somebody's going to bring me out my food. Um, I mean, you, there still has to be some interaction so there's still got to be somebody that brings out the food. There's still got to be somebody that comes and brings you your drinks. I mean, so you, you mean to tell me that you're, you're, you're cutting some of the employees, but there's going to be, to me, some sort of, of issue because um, you're not going to be, to me, as productive. Computers sometimes end up making things worse, not better. Um, in the restaurant business, I can definitely say that I think that it's going to be for the worse. But they're willing to try anything to cut costs to try to get the profits up. And, I mean, this right. is just another, another play on that. Um, they don't know if it's going to work or not. They don't know. But they're going to do anything they can because basically paying people minimum wage is not allowing them to be profitable, which tells you that there's hardly anybody spending money in these restaurants. Right? Yeah. Which tells you people don't have excess disposable income to spend in restaurants. So back to real estate, if they can't afford an Applebee's enchilada or fajitas, whatever they sell there, how are they going to buy a house? Well, not only that, Lewis, they've, they're already offering two-for-20 dinner deals, right? <laughs> Which, I mean, so if we can't get them into the restaurants and eat, like, two-for-20 deals, um, and then we're going to add a computer screen into it, what is that going to change anything? It's not going to change anything because the whole point of why they won't go there is because they don't have the money to do it. Right. Right? So they're, they're actually spending, to me, Good, any money they have, they're throwing it right back away because that's not the problem of why they can't get people in there or why they can't be profitable. It's because these people, uh, people out there that are trying to find jobs can't. They don't, they're, they're not able to keep steady work. I mean, I've talked numerous times about the government contractors that I talk to that are around the D.C. metro area. And do you know what I'm hearing, Willis? They're all in a stalemate right now. We're talking about huge companies, not, not the, um, the big ones like Lockheed Martin, but pretty close, the ones that would be right underneath there. Mm -hmm. And they are absolutely struggling. There's a couple firms because of all these contracts have just been suspended. They, they, they can't pay their employees any longer. It's not like working direct for the government where they were basically knew their paycheck was coming. When these right. people work for government contractors, once that contract's suspended, it's unstopped. Guess what? They can't pay their employees. Have we're you heard, about Ryan, what the, about the budget debates? Well, I've heard a lot of rumblings. I mean, <laughs> well, apparently the the latest is, and I haven't seen a lot of press on it, but I did read it in a couple of places that there isn't going to be this big uh, right up to the end discussion uh, at the brink of crisis deadline because what apparently they've agreed to is raising the debt ceiling, and the Republicans apparently have agreed to. Increase in spending. <laughs> so it may eliminate that issue of whether the United States can pay its debts and you know, the whole debacle. But it actually makes things worse if they basically just said, look, it's not worth the aggravation to go through to even think about cutting spending. We're already screwed. Let's just avoid that debacle. We've got elections coming up in 2014. So let's just, quote, do our jobs and spend more money. And no one's going to notice and no one's going to complain because people want the, the services that we spend money on. Lewis, you and I talked about this for a long time, right? We said the same thing. We were like, you're already on a course of destruction. So you why might as well just throw it. Yeah. It's like if you have $20,000 in credit card debt, why try to pay it back? Exactly. Go shopping and get it to twenty five because you're yeah, not going to pay it anyway. It's the same well, with the United yeah, States. And, and you, and you think about it, it's like, you know, when they, when they realized what they actually did when they went through that whole mess of, you know, just a couple months ago. You shut the Lincoln they, Memorial. Big deal. Well, yeah, but you, when that you figure about, me. like, 
the, the, the Republicans now and, and, and the Democrats alike, I mean, nobody really, I think, wants that negative light going into that next election if they oh, were the reason why, right? They, they, they were the reason why there was a second shutdown. So I think both parties agree. And you know Obama with the negative light that he's got cast over him with the, the, the employment report that was basically fake going into the last election. Oh. He, has to, he has to keep everything above board with Obama. Oh, here's the Karen thing. The Democrats America. and Republicans want to do their, quote, job avoid a shutdown, avoid any wrangling so the Republicans can focus on the falls of the, the flaws of Obamacare and the Democrats can run away from Obamacare and say, look, we were good congressmen. We, we finally got together with our Republican. Uh, yep. We made them see sense and we, we cleared up this problem. Um, but this Obamacare thing, you know, I'm, I'm opposed to that. I want to fix that. And so that's yep. going to be the, the theme is not the budget shutdown, not the deficit. The theme is going to be figuring out health care, and you're going to have all types of winners and losers on that side, Democrats proposing alternative solutions, Republicans trying to shut it down. But in, the event, in, a, in a sense, it's still gridlock because if Obamacare isn't working, nothing is working because it's already, quote, law of the land, and that monkey wrench is already in the health care system. So now that's a problem. Yeah, and you know what? The, the next election will be run on – hey, guess what? Obamacare doesn't work, right? That's the only thing that they're going to be concentrating on. They're not going to be talking about uh, the economy again. Right. We've got to fix Obamacare. Yeah, we just got to fix well, Obamacare. Well, you do. I mean, it, 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 was a, it was a government-created problem uh, of a solution. It, it was an attempt to, to solve a problem that didn't exist. Now they created a bigger problem for which we now need them to create a solution. Correct. <laughs> Right, because if and, you look at what the health care issues were, pre-existing conditions and a lot of people without health care, fine. They didn't go after that. They did, but they went after everything else. They right. overhauled the entire system to deal with pre-existing conditions and to deal with the people who didn't have health care. Everybody else was satisfied, 60, 70, 80 percent of the people. But now what they've done is they've thrown a monkey wrench and they've basically screwed everybody because... Even the people, I guess the only people that win in this are the pre-existing conditions, but I don't even know if, if they're even able to get health care because they can't get online and get it. I know. So, so no one's really won in this, and now we've got another problem that's going to require tons of government spending and conferences and bills and campaign money is going to be spent. You know, I'm for it. I'm against it. My plan is this. My plan is better. And enormous sums of money are going to be spent in the next, what, coming nine months up to October, trying to figure this out and trying to elect candidates to try to figure it out with new proposals. Well, you know, and, and now that we've, we've discussed, a, you know, basically it looks like there's not going to be an impending shutdown again. Um, who's to say, remember how we kept discussing about, you know, how long can things play out? If there's really not another bottleneck that's going to occur in January or February, then and we continue down that path of just letting things go, increasing the debt limit. I mean, this could go, this could ride out, as I suggested, for many more years, yeah. right? Well, um, until the market says enough. And that, which, that is going to come when Russia, when China's already stopped buying the debt, or, or said they're going to stop buying it. When Russia, China, Iran, Brazil, the BRIC countries, India, get together and decide... That's fine. You do what you want, but we're not paying for it. We're not buying the bonds. And then the United States has to accept a lower standard of living and has to make cuts because they can't borrow any more money. But right now, there's no incentive to pose self-discipline because you have all these economists talking about, well, debt to GDP doesn't matter. Deficits don't matter. Look, we have troubles enough. We can't be forcing austerity on ourselves. Austerity is a bad word. All right. You don't enforce austerity, austerity upon yourself, the market will do it for you eventually. And when it does, it doesn't do it discriminately. It does it indiscriminately and just takes your credit card away. Yeah. Now you can't be a prudent, a prudent spender. You can't try to pay down your debt in certain ways. You, you basically have to go cold turkey. And as you know, that's a lot harder. And there's Absolutely. been no, if you think about it, the Tea Party, whatever you want to call it, five years of this stuff. Nothing has changed. No. In fact, it's gotten worse. They spend more money. They've done more QE. And all they've done is talk about tapering QE. And if you think about tapering, tapering just means, so what if they, they spend $15, 20 $10 billion less one month? 
they're still blowing $65, $70 billion of money printed out of thin air. And they're not going to taper one month and then the next month. It's not going to be over in like three months. Even if if they start it, it'll be a disaster. If they finish it, it'll be even worse. Well, you know, you and I do this show every week, and we sit here, and we can talk about this stuff, and we can talk about what's actually taking place, the reality of things. But when you listen to things that are on TV, CNN and CNBC and MSNBC and all those shows, they have the craziest views about what's actually taking place. I mean, one of the biggest questions that has been asked lately is, uh, uh, basically, are, are we having an asset bubble, right, especially in the stock market? And, you know, I thought it was interesting. I think it was George Soros had the quote of um, financial markets uh, are far from accurately reflecting all the available knowledge. It always provide a distorted view of reality, right? And where are they getting their distorted view of reality from? The Federal Reserve, right? Of course. That's where they're getting it from. That's I mean, interventionism it, into the market yeah. in a massive way. Absolutely. I mean, they don't have a choice but to accept the views of the Fed, right? Because what, what's the alternative? Is it? I mean, the alternative would be that the stock market would be at like 6000 right now instead of going towards 16000 Oh, know what sure. I mean? and, and if you think about it, but for intervention in the gold and silver market, those prices would be a lot higher. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's the reason Bitcoin is up tens of thousands of a percent is because people are willing to believe a myth of a computer game <laughs> invented invented value, and they'll put all this intellectualizing around it. Really, what they're doing is they're saying anything is better than the money that's forced upon us that can be printed at will. So we're just going to create an artificial scarcity of bitcoins <laughs> based on an algorithm, and that's better. And if people want to use that, that's better. Well, that's nonsense because the real purpose of money is to have sound money, not just to create some artificial scarcity and say, see, I'm only going to make uh, 21 million of these things based on how many times Ryan runs around the block. doesn't matter that that's not, that we don't need Ryan to run around the block, you know, as many times as he can. What we need is scarcity and money. So it's 21 million. So forget what it's based on. And people believe that and they're willing to pay enormous sums of money just to get out of the dollar. And they yeah, think, well, you know, oh, if I need to send money to Argentina, who needs to send money to Argentina? Right. <laughs> There's not that many people that need to. Or if I have to get on a plane, you know, in a crisis, I can't bring my gold with me. Is that really what yeah. you're worried about? Right. No, you're worried yeah. about the value of the dollar. And, Absolutely. And the dollar keeps getting printed and printed and printed, and every government on earth, the large ones, are just printing more of it. So and, people and, and are willing to accept anything. Well, wouldn't you believe then, with that being the case, that these same large financial institutions, hedge funds, um, you know, big banks that have access to this cheap capital, right, that are basically pouring money into the stock market, really driving it higher, uh, which is just a byproduct of, of being able to borrow, you know, cheap money or, or basically 0% money, um, that the, these same banks, they understand this, right? So at the same time that they're basically pushing all that money into the stock market, they're the same people that are also buying gold, silver, and Bitcoin to basically hedge against. If they win, the stock market would collapse, right? Because right. They, can play, they can play the other side of this to where they don't lose. It's just an arbitrage situation where of they'll take advantage, take advantage of the gains that they have now. Due when to you get effect. free money, you're allowed to speculate. And the advantage of having free money when you're spe- a speculator is, in the words of Joe Pesci, if you win, you win. If you lose, you still win because you right. can't lose. It's free money. Yeah. You place your bets everywhere, and usually when things when you're speculating and the game is rigged, you win anyway. But even if Absolutely. you lose, the money was free. So whatever assets you managed to acquire during that time period, as long as they weren't all in one speculative asset that crashed, you win. Yeah, and People you know have already made wins. fortunes in Bitcoin, made fortunes in the stock market. The only yeah. losers are the ones who are just going to keep it there. Well, they're not going to keep it there. When you have $100, $200, 300000000 million, it's generally not all in Bitcoin. It's not all nope. the stock market. They buy fine art. They buy gold. They buy properties. They buy a lot of other stuff that they otherwise couldn't have bought but for the gains they made in their speculative endeavors. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's not, and when it all comes crashing down at some point, it's not the rich that are going to lose. No. Every, they're going to lose. No, they're going to lose. They're going to see their net worth go from $400 million to $200 million. Yeah. But they started at $3 million. 
Exactly. They've already made their fortunes, and, it, and, it, and it, it's really irrelevant. But it, it actually crushes the middle class. It'll push them back down to the lower middle class to the poor. Right? Yeah, what if, Brian, yeah. Ryan, what if you had $20,000 in, th- in, your, in your account and you made $100,000 $100, in Bitcoin or $100,000 on the stock market? Well, what ends up happening is, let's say you sell it, you think you're smart, you make money. Now you owe taxes on that amount of money. And when tax time comes around, you don't have the money because – you didn't sell all your stocks or all of your Bitcoin. They've now gone down to a point where you can't even sell the remaining amount to pay the tax bill on the game you have. <laughs> right. Okay. That's, that's, that's how the little guy gets crushed. Even if he thinks yeah. he's playing the, the big boy game, he gets in, he gets some gains, then he can't pay his tax bill because the gains don't stick. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a vicious cycle there for, you know, for people that are trying to do what the big boys are doing. Um, it's like with housing, yeah, right? Good idea, absolutely. leverage up, get a house, goes up to seven hundred thousand. You could ride that out if you had cash, even though one, but you can if your mortgage goes up. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and you know, lose your so house. We've had all this talk of obviously taper, taper, taper. Like I told you, I, I don't see it happening. It doesn't really matter to me. They can talk about it all they want, and and you know these these shows can talk about it all they want, and and I have the they have now like the taper meters now where how many months out are we from actually tapering? I'm like this is a joke that we're even talking about this. You need to take the damn graph off there because it, it's it's a joke that we're showing that they haven't done anything really in five years. Why would we think that they're going to do something now? Remember uh, the housing here? recovery watches they had all summer. Absolutely. Now they're realizing, uh, well, for the last five months, there's a decrease in. Uh, Pending home sales or decrease in mortgage applications, maybe there really isn't a housing recovery. Maybe just the price went up because the Fed had interest rates low. Yeah, well, you know, it's going to be really interesting because we have the qualified residential mortgage rule that takes place January the 10th of 2014. Right. Unless out of unless out of you know clear blue, they just decide to push this back a year or two, right? <laughs> um, but we already have interest rates that have risen over half a percent in the last two weeks. We still have all the talk talks of tapering. We have Janet Yellen who's going to take her post at the beginning of next year. We have a lot of stuff that's going on. We still have, obviously, the budget talks and from what you and I just discussed, looks like they're going to be able to work things out. But my thought is, this qualified residential mortgage rule, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's basically a rule that's going to change the quality. It, in order for a bank, credit union, to be able to give you a mortgage, there's certain rules that they have to follow. One of the rules is actually it's a, it's a reduction in, in person's debt-to-income ratio. So the percentage of your income um, divided by your debt is going to go down. So it's going to basically make – if you were affording maybe a $400,000 house, it's going to maybe take it now to a $360,000 house, right? Well, is that good for, for home prices, Lewis? No. If, if, if people could go up to 45% of their income and now they can only go to it's 43%, do you think that's going to hurt home? Well, they can borrow more? less. They can't they can do as well. They can pay less. Well, guess what? And now it, it's basically – this is, is it's really to help the banks because it's taking the liability off the banks. So if, they, if they originate a qualified residential mortgage, that they're, not, they're going to be, basically be exempt from being able to be sued, right? It's going to take the liability away from them. So – They've already projected that there's probably going to be a basically a 20% decrease in the amount of loans that would be approved now to what will will be approved after January 10th of 2014. Do you think that's going to help the, the housing market? Nope. No. So if now, now we have an increase in interest rates in the last two weeks, a half a percent. We have the qualified residential mortgage rule that's going to take place January 10th. What do you think Janet Yellen's going to have to do? What do you think she's going to have to do, Lewis? I mean, well, to well, me... It's the only natural thing that she can do, which is to put into a negative interest rate situation to try to get interest rates back down. And then we have QE eternity, right? Okay, so here's a question, Ryan. As we get off the show, as we wind down the show, the employment numbers will come out. These are considered very important as to whether there's going to be a taper or not. Using your analysis, do you think that they will have the numbers, because they can manipulate them any way they want within, within a range, that the numbers will come in well ahead of expectations, right on spot, or below, and then what would be the implication immediately in the market, and then what would that mean for December taper and then next year? Well, judging by how we've had such great economic news over the last two weeks, mm-hmm. I would think that this non-farm payroll number would be spot on, if not just maybe slightly, slightly above, are better than expectations, 
but not enough for it to really manipulate interest rates any further. If it comes in much better than expectation, we could see interest rates rise another quarter of a percent today. Literally. Right, because that would mean almost taper was assured, correct? Absolutely. In the, in the minds of the market. Absolutely. And, now, and, and you also, also remember, this is happening on a Friday, right, heading into the mm-hmm. weekend. So these are big days. These are big days where you could see huge increases or just nothing at all happen. And I'm thinking that this is one of the situations where it should be nothing at all happen. However, I'm not ruling that out. Um, and, and let's, they're trying to keep this momentum flowing through, like I said, through this holiday season to give everybody this false sense of what's going on. I mean, but don't I they really don't they need now, Ryan, to tap the brakes on the taper inevitability and so on? Yes. So yes, then, in what, my opinion, they do. They need they need to tap the brakes on, which in, in that case would basically we would have non-farm payrolls come in worse than expected. Right? Correct. That's what, so this way they that's can say, oh, happen. we didn't know it, things looked well. Or if they do come in better than expected, in your theory, that they want to show everybody keep spending, everything is fine, they can always revise it down or they can say, um, still, it was a good report, but we want to see more of it. Exactly. Well, that's – and see, the next time Bernanke talks, he will say, well, it looks like we're moving in the right direction. We're going to need right. to see more results over an extended period of time. So the next time that these key reports come out the following month, they're going to be worse, Right. Or they're going to be okay, and they're not going to be as, you know, robust. It's, it's, it's like you said, as long as you can remain in the middle of the road where things aren't much better or much worse, right? Which is yeah, so really what you're key. saying is basically the report doesn't matter. It could be if it's really high, they already have a base in, built-in excuse that, well, we have to wait and see. If it's in the middle, it's like, well, we definitely have to wait and see. If it's really bad, they say, well, we have to wait and see because we need to do more. Yeah, and, and, and see, <laughs> it doesn't matter, except short term, because if the rates do, if, if it is a great, great report today, rates will skyrocket and they'll have to backpedal at some point. And see, and that's where it really stinks for, for potential buyers out there right now. Absolutely. Is that the short term implications of this is that I had a client literally that was, that was looking and didn't go under ch- contract until about a week ago. And a week ago, he was looking at interest rates a half to five eighths lower than where they are now, right? That changed his payment a couple hundred bucks. He was looking at a $500,000 house. So in the short term, these things really do take a toll on people. Um, and, 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 you know, in the long term, it's really not a big deal for people that aren't, aren't really looking to buy. But in the short term, we really do have to pay attention to these reports. I mean, it really is important to constantly have, you know, your finger on the pulse of what the Fed's doing, saying maybe what they're going to do in the future because all these things now – are intertwined. I mean, the real estate market is 100% predicated on what the Fed does. I don't care about anything else anymore, to be honest with you, Lewis, because if, if they can continue to keep in straight lows, I don't think home prices are going, especially in the D.C. metro area and major metropolitan areas, as long as the interest rates stay somewhat reasonable, we'll have basically stable conditions, maybe increasing in certain subdivisions and maybe slightly just decreasing which is, I think, what they want to accomplish. They want right. to have that, right? That's, that's, once again, they want, it, they want the middle of the road, right? They don't want to keep interest rates at 3%, and they don't want them to go to 6%. So, <laughs> Absolutely. So well, people don't realize, Ryan, when the, when the rate goes from 26 to 3 you say, oh, it's only you know, 4 base. Four, it's not that much. It's 15%, though. It's 15%. Do you that's think massive. And just when you think about the cost of money, it's supposed to be kind of stable. And because the rates are so low, when they move up, you know, from 2.6 to 2.7 to 2.8, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Well, do you think do you think it's not a big deal to the banks that are lending it out at those at those levels? So not Ooh. only can they, you know, now instead of giving you a loan at three percent, they can give you a loan at four and a half percent, and at the same time they'll turn around and they'll invest in the stock market, make their fortunes there, but they're getting a, a fixed rate of return from you of higher than you know what they were getting before. I mean. They are, the banks are making money hand over fist, and as interest rates rise up, it's actually going to help them. But also, Lewis, the one thing we have to pay attention to is the other reason why this paper talk, I think, has to come to an end is because naturally we can't have, we can't have these uh, even the Fed fund rates, and that's why they typically talk about them separately, right? Right. We can't, ever, we can't ever really – if we start talking about the economy is getting better, then we have to start talking about increasing that federal fund rate, right? Right, and you but, can't talk about keeping it low for years. And you can't talk about not tapering. You have to talk about ending the program and ending the accommodative monetary policy. It can't happen. Hey, Brian, what did you think of not only Bernanke commenting 
and saying that Bitcoin held promise, but also the Bank of America coming out yesterday and saying it's, you know, it can reach a fair valuation of $1,300 a, a, a coin. What do you make of the bank somewhat sounding like they're embracing something where they never would have made these types of comments about gold? I think that they know that what I've talked about all along is that, you know, fiat currencies cannot remain intact forever. They just can't, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that there is alternative currencies coming, and, and the, the virtual currency is the start of it. I don't think that it's the, the end answer, but I think that these banks recognize, because they're the ones that are so heavily invested in the stock market, that that's a, a, one way to completely hedge against the dollar, is to bet on these alternative currencies along with betting on well, gold. Well, why, why not bet on, but, but the difference that I'm getting at is why not bet on gold or silver? And I think the because reason is they want... Panic? To control, and you know, digital currency is what they've always been the holy grail for banking and governments because they can track every transaction. Now they could say, oh, you can't track Bitcoin. That's nonsense. Eventually you can. There's a public ledger. They can eventually start to figure out who owns what and so on. That allows total taxation because if you can right. see where everyone spends it, they don't like gold or silver or cash because that's what you commit crimes with. Well, that's what people committed crimes with, you know, money laundering with Bitcoin. But now they're probably realizing that with Bitcoin, they can figure it out. They can gain yeah. control of these types of digital systems in a way that they can't control physical transactions. And that's probably why they've embraced it. Wouldn't there be another side to that, too, that if the banks came out and really started embracing gold and silver and purchasing in, in such large amounts that the price of gold and silver shot up, that creates panic amongst people because typically when those things are rising, that's a direct indicator that the dollar Correct. is in terrible trouble. But and that's why they have the ETFs because they can manipulate the price of gold and silver, not just through naked short selling on the COMEX, but by in conjunction with the amounts that are in the ETF, they could be loaned, hypothecated, and so on. They can control the price. The problem they're seeing with Bitcoin is if they're not involved, they can't control the price but they have an advantage that if they use legislation and strong arm and computer hacking, they can gain control of the Bitcoin system, and it can be firmly far more in their control than the price of a physical commodity where there's a limit to Absolutely. how much gold there is. So that's, you know, that, that's the problem they're coming up with right now with trying to manipulate gold and silver is you can make it short sell, but only to the point where if you have to pay on the demand of physical, you can't do it, then your game is up. Whereas with digital, you can control a digital uh, currency pretty easily once you gain control of it. Yep. And I think that's probably why uh, the banks are starting to, I wouldn't say embrace it, but they aren't. Because if you think about it, it's a security. You, if you and I invent it, it seems like there's no law preventing you and, you and me, you and I, from going out and creating a currency tomorrow and throwing it out on the market. How is it any different than if you and I went out and tried to sell securities without registering them? Right. Well, you're not allowed to do that. But somehow right. they're allowing people to create digital currencies. And I think it's because the government doesn't have the resources to invest in this. Right. So they're allowing, just like with Facebook, and you know, they allow private companies to do the work. And then they go in and they can you – know, you see what they've done with Facebook. That's basically yep. a way of looking at what everybody's doing without having to create the infrastructure. Yep. So let the, they let the private market do it, and then they go in and they say, okay, Facebook, show me, same with AT&T, show me your, your phone records. Yep. Well, it could be the same with Bitcoin. Eventually, you know, they, they figure out a way to get in and figure out what people are doing. It's a lot easier to figure out that than it is to find out cash transactions or other transactions. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think all of the things that you just highlighted are, you know, and, and for Bernanke to bring that up is it, really odd, right? For him to even acknowledge it. Really? He says he doesn't understand gold and he holds it, but somehow he thinks, yeah, Bitcoin, I get it. You know, you know the blockchain and all that stuff. Sure, that's I right. promise. <laughs> Hashtag, yeah, makes, I get it. Makes complete sense to me. Virtual currency, I'm on board with that. Yeah, um, well, I, I guess the other reason he's on board with it is they just invented the value based on some artificial scarcity. Well, he, he understands fiat currencies. He's saying the private sector does what I do, except they've put a limit on what I do. Yeah, I, I and, and I mean – well, you know, we, and we talked about this, how, you know, there's always going to be, and, and see, this, this could be the shift, right, where there's always going to be an alternative or something that comes up. And, 
and it, it, it could be going from the dollar to something else. Now, this is going to be a slow process, but this is the first step when people start acknowledging an alternate form of, of currency, right? When they right. start acknowledging this stuff, and I mean, a lot of time it starts as like bartering and things like that, but for people that, I mean, PayPal is accepting Bitcoin. Many of the places are accepting this. This is going to be, when, the more and more common it becomes, I mean, people are going to talk less and less about the dollar until the dollar just kind of phases itself out into whatever new currency we really do move to, which, like you said, the Bitcoin, is some, some form of that, it, it could actually, that could be what takes place. It really could. Um, yeah, and the thing I is, mean, the people who are paying attention to it, either governments or extremely wealthy people, they will make any threat work to their advantage. They either crush a threat or they embrace a threat. Yep. And that's it's, why it's, it's odd to see them embracing what is a direct threat. When right. basically you're saying, we're going to invent the currency, and you're not going to have anything to do with it. And, and in fact, we're going to limit it, and it's going to be peer-to-peer, and it's anonymous. That's a big you know, middle finger, <laughs> metaphorically, to the banks. And they say, oh, yeah, well, that's a good thing. There's something wrong there. There is. There you, know, is. You, you get sand sword in your face, and you say, well, I think it does me good to have sand sword in my face. You know, maybe, maybe one day you'll bury me. Right. They, yeah. they, they, something, is, something is amiss there. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, it's definitely something that we should, you know, we'll pay closer attention to as more and more people speak on it. Um, and obviously, more and more individuals, corporations, and banks are acknowledging that this is taking place now. Where versus before, nobody, everybody was like, "Oh, Bitcoin, that's not going to last," right? right? Now, all of a sudden, we've seen the levels that they've jumped to, and like you said, the government—they're probably thinking to themselves, "You know what? This could be a good thing because we could really manipulate that. That would be a lot easier to manipulate." You can also destroy it. One of the things I thought about how you can destroy it, you can buy up, even at these prices, all the Bitcoins yep. and just don't use them. Right. They're yeah. gone. You can say, well, there's scarcity. No, no, no. No one's going to trust a currency that has, you know, 800 left. Yep. <laughs> so these things Absolutely. can be manipulated. They can be embraced. I, I just don't believe it just because if anybody can sit around and create a construct and then claim the value is, is that they got everybody else to create uh, mining applications and, and payment systems around it. That just means, you know, you're, you're a good P.T. Barnum man. You've managed to get a lot of people to believe that you've created value. And people yeah, well, can just as easily move away from that value. And that's unlike real estate was you really can't say a house is worthless. Unless right. it's like toxic waste under it or something like that, a house is always going to have value. You have to live somewhere. Right. A yeah, Bitcoin, it's a you don't have to. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons, you know, you and I are fans of real estate, maybe not always of the pricing or, or worrying about the, uh, the cash flow that you might get from it, but in general, you can't go 100% wrong with real estate unless you end up losing it because you borrow more money than you can afford to pay back. Absolutely. And if you take advantage and if you're able to lock in at low fixed rates and, you know, um, make that protecting your home ownership cost or even the cost of owning that home fixed for 30 plus years at low interest rates, I mean, a lot of times you're going to come out ahead on those deals. Um, as long as that is, as long as you have a job that you can pay that mortgage back. Right. Um, so, I mean, there is always a flip side of that coin, but, you know, I, I think that um, I, I'll tell people so I'm below the place. I still think it's a fantastic time to buy houses, guys, if you're able to. Um, I, like I said, don't, if you're, if you're, don't buy your primary residence to speculate on the future value because I think that's a recipe for disaster. And I tell people that all day, every day, because that would require you to have inside knowledge as to what the Fed's thinking, what Congress, the government, what everybody's thinking, right. and what their, their long-term plans are. They have and you, could, you can even know all that and still be wrong on your interpretation. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know what? Just think about this, Lewis. You and I have thought for how long now that stuff was just going to hit the fan, and it hasn't yet. Right. That doesn't mean it's not going to, <laughs> but it's a matter of timing. It's a matter of when is it going to happen. And you know what? You, you think a little bit more short-term than I do. I think it's going to be longer-term because they've gotten away with it for five years. There's no reason why I wouldn't think that they can get away for 10 years. Um, but it's, it's, it's all a waiting game, guys. So, you know, the best thing is to not try to predict the future. If, if, you, if you can buy something today at low fixed rates, you can qualify, then do so. And if you're in a situation now where you don't think that you can buy, try to get your credit in line so that you can take advantage of, uh, you know, even if they go to 5%. There's still low interest rates, guys. Uh, you know, 6% below, to me, are still fantastic interest rates. Um, 
And so I would highly advise anybody that's out there that's, you know, in a position where you're renting and, and you're worried about the future of the economy and all those things, if you can lock yourself in low fixed rates, like I said, there's credit unions out there that's 0% financing up to $650,000 in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia right now. 720 credit score, we can get these type of deals done, but to start by reaching out to a professional, I can put you in touch with them. Um, we're coming up on the end of the show, Lewis. I want to thank you again for a great show. For any questions anybody has for you, where can they reach you at? Smoggle.com, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D. It's like say, spelling small with a S-M-A-U-L, and then the abbreviation of gold, G-L-D. Perfect, Lewis. I appreciate your time as always. Thank Guys, you. Make sure that you uh, tune in to us on iTunes, Real Estate 360 on there, and also visit our website at realestate360live.com. Have a fantastic weekend. Take care.